I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Abhishek Singh, partner, leads the cloud transformation research for Everest Group. As a partner with the firm, Abhishek is responsible for growth, client relationships, and thought leadership in North America. Bishal Gupta, vice president, leads the data and analytics and artificial intelligence research and advisory for Everest Group. He assists clients on a wide array of topics related to market opportunity assessment, thought leadership, partnership strategy, and enterprises adoption benchmarking. Nisha Krishan, practice director, leads interactive experience research and advisory for Everest Group. She assists IT service providers, design agencies, and consultancies on a wide range of topics that includes mergers and acquisition approach, partnership strategy, thought leadership, and market potential assessment. Sengamesh Karagag is a senior analyst in Everest Group's enterprise platform services practice within ITS. In this role, he tracks the major platforms, including SAP, Oracle, Salesforce, ServiceNow, and Microsoft. He advises global service providers and enterprises in technology-related strategic decision-making around topics such as digital transformation, platform strategy, go-to-market strategy, and deal constructs. Deepti Sekri is a senior analyst with the cloud and infrastructure services team at Everest Group. She helps providers, enterprises, and investors with engagements around cloud, data center, and networks research and advisory. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Abhishek. Thank you. All right. So we'll start off by checking the sentiments of the group. So before we jump into the poll question itself, we wanted to do this webinar slightly different this time, wherein we wanted to check the sentiment first before diving into some of the hypotheses about the market that we have for 2023. And as I can see, some of the poll reactions coming in uh, seems interesting the way the voting is moving right now. The idea is we will share five themes which we think will drive a significant portion of how service providers are likely to conduct business this time, largely driven by the demand themes. And once we get a reaction to the polls, we'll see what the sentiment of the group is. And then using that as an anchor, we'll take it forward. All right, I think it's time now to, okay, let's give it a few more seconds. All right, so as you can see the results, uh, it's kind of a very balanced reaction to it, but I see like likely to remain constant and above, which, is mean, which means increase normally, significantly increase in terms of IT initiative spending that comprises almost like uh, 70%, so yeah, almost uh, uh, close to that. So that's, this, is, this is pretty much interesting how positive this group is. And it is with the same sense of positivity that I would like to jump into the themes that we see playing out. And obviously the elephant in the room is going to be addressing this question of, hey, there is a possible recession that is likely to play out. And what is our hypothesis regarding that? I'll be addressing that first, but just to take you, take you through the discussions points for today, First up, uh, I will be covering the IT services outlook for 2023. We'll look at what are the major buckets in which IT services spend is likely to happen and how it has been behaving. So some of the retrospective data as it plays out into 2023 is something that I would like to address first. And then we'll be jumping into the top five themes, which is the major aspect of what we wanted to cover here. And then we'll wrap it up by a slew of a Q and A. So let's start off by addressing the question of, hey, how is IT services 
spending holding up against what we see as a possible recession. If you see this particular chart, I know there are so, so many snakes moving around this particular chart, but let me clarify what this says. What the blue solid line that you see is the GDP growth of 48 major economies getting correlated against what you see in this solid red line, which is the IT services spending. And as you can see over the history of, since this chart uh, starts off from in 2017, there has been a large, by and large, a correlation between how GDP spend and IT services spend have uh, kind of stayed true to each other. But in the last few quarters, something surprising has happened. So while GDP growth has slowed down significantly, IT services spend has kind of kept up. And even if you see IT services spend being split into the different elements of spending, which are the dotted lines, so consulting and SI, apps outsourcing and infrastructure outsourcing, you can see where that growth is really coming from. Obviously, app, consulting and SI uh, spend, it seems to be driving the bulk of growth for this industry. So the question in your mind probably is, hey, why is this disconnect happening? Uh, we have a few hypotheses and we'll be going through the major themes which will outline why uh, this disconnect appears, but I wanted to leave you with one thought. Tech in many ways has become the redeemer for a, most of the industries that we work with, whether it's banking and financial services, whether it's in, in uh, energy and utilities, public sector, all of them have started using technology and digital channels to engage with their internal stakeholders as well as consumers. And that is one of the reasons why, even if you might say that, hey, this is old wine and new bottle, the simply the scaled aspect of technology being relevant to industries and has gone through seminal change in the last few years. And that is the reason why we believe this disconnect appears because even for business resilience, for managing contingencies, a lot of industries are looking at technology services spending to help them wade through crisis. So even during a recession, expect that technology be one, will be one of those levers for managing efficiency, for driving productivity, and for business resilience. So that's the point. Moving on to the next slide, that's where you will see some of these numbers kind of break, broken down by different buckets or towers of services, which get consumed by enterprises under the IT services umbrella. The key message that I wanted to leave you here with is that a major chunk of what you see is being uh, from IT services spending perspective is being driven by enterprise platform services, which are the large packages, the products that organizations use, whether these relate to ERP, CRM, collaboration, and all of those. And a big chunk of that also happens through bespoke application development and management. Obviously, there, there is an underlying layer of infrastructure, digital workplace, and all of those services. But a big chunk of the pivot in for many enterprises still happens to be the platforms around which they are building their technology core. And we'll get into the details of what those major themes across these areas are. But just to give you another lens of how this spending is likely to behave, if you move on to the next slide, which is the industry view of it, as you can see, as we are looking at these different industries, in terms of what they contribute by way of spend on technology services, what we see clearly is that obviously all of um, folks who operate in this space would know that banking and financial services plus insurance happens to be the uh, largest sector in terms of spending on technology, but there are other sectors also who are now very much meaningful in terms of increasing their spend. And if you look at the bottom half of this chart, which talks about expected future growth, don't go just by the numbers. They might just seem small from the perspective, but if you look at the base, the 100% here is $637 billion of spend happening annually uh, that's the 2022 number, and we are projecting somewhere close to 4 to 5% growth on top of this base. As you can see, there is significant growth that is likely to take place across sectors, even during the period that we are talking about right now with all the concerns around recession and everything happening. Key call out here, uh, energy and utilities and healthcare life sciences is likely to be the fastest growing, are likely to be the fastest growing sectors amongst the group of uh, folks we are looking at here. But 
depending on the size of the firm you are, which industry you focus on, et cetera, you are still likely to uh, have opportunities for wallet share growth and even incremental revenue growth that is likely to play out. Moving on. Now, this, this is the money slide in terms of how to look at how the growth sectors that are likely to play out. If you see, this has been our tracking of the market in terms of how we have seen growth play out in the last few years. Obviously, there was a blip in between wherein during the pandemic, but the market bounced back. Now, what we are projecting is that even for 2023, there will be 4.4% uh, uh, of growth on the base that we just talked about, which is $637 billion, which is likely to further accelerate toward the next five years till 2028 at a rate of 5.5%. So essentially, we are all in a growth market, despite concerns. And as I was also looking at the sentiment analysis into which you had responded, in general, uh, while there is concerns, there are concern, uh, concerns around so slowness and spend, et cetera, but we are likely to be in a growth market unless we don't, I don't have a crystal ball, unless something falls off a cliff, we should all be in very good shape as we continue to engage with the market. Now, back to the question of what we are trying to cover in this webinar moving on to the next slide these are the major themes that we will be talking about which will help you as service providers drive growth and even take wallet more wallet share in the inclined environments that you operate in uh, obviously my colleagues will be going into the details of each of these themes but just calling it out here cloud and value realization from it is a major major theme that we see and across across industries and very closely related to it is the whole care question of how organizations manage data their enterprise data and also leverage ai as a technology to make their data goals uh, scalable and helpful for their business goals we touched upon the question of platforms that happens to be the common denominator base on which most organizations are building their technology base so that's where we are going to talk about how industry specific it's going to become and then the last two topics are very, very industry specific in how enterprises one, they are trying to drive stakeholder experience and not just consumer experience as the central investment philosophy and how security, which is protecting the uh, perimeters of an organization against external threats, which is becoming a major topic is something also that we would like to cover. Now, before we dive into the specifics of these themes, what we wanted to offer you was an opportunity for a complimentary 30 minute conversation on any of these topics. And you see the stakeholders here, uh, the key SMEs who will be running through this. So pick one and we can go into much higher level of detail uh, in terms of what we could provide you as insights into each of these topics. And as we go through some of the details of these, you will see these play out. All right, on that note, uh, let's start off by going into these major themes that I just kind of briefly ran through and I'll be handing it over uh, to my colleague Deepthi to take us through the first theme, which is cloud. Thanks Abhishek. Uh, so for this section, we will discuss how our enterprise expectations evolving from a cloud adoption perspective, how this theme of maximizing value from cloud becoming extremely important and what it means for service providers. So if we move on, we are seeing a shift in enterprise asks from, I want to move to cloud, where the most explicit mention of cloud is there towards something like I have business objectives to meet where cloud is positioned more as an enabler and entire focus is on, on meeting those business objectives. So if you take a look at the timeline view, prior to 2020, conversations were more technology centric. The objective there behind moving to cloud was to meet requirements of efficiency, requirements of cost, requirements of resiliency. Post 2020 and for most of the enterprises currently, Cloud is mostly a mean to meet the digitization demands of their businesses in order to serve their customers important. What will become more important in future and where we see demand coming from is the shift towards value generation focused cloud objectives. 
Here, the emphasis is not just digitization of the core light we discussed in 2020, but it is also on how do you stay ahead of the curve in terms of how quickly you are able to create new products and services, how efficiently you can launch new business streams, and how can you enable innovation in your businesses. So put together, there is an evolution we are seeing uh, that is happening from cloud for efficiency towards cloud for digital and then towards cloud for value. Now let's spend some time to discuss cloud for value. Uh, if you move to the next slide, the first step is how do you define value, right? So taking into account enterprises evolved expectations and the challenges they are facing, we at Everest Group have synthesized cloud for, cloud for value definition into three major buckets. First one is the cost factor, second one is the efficiency factor, and the third one is strategic factor. Now, what is important to notice and also to consider over here is that value not just focuses on the cloud aspect of, uh, sorry, on the cost aspect of cloud adoption, but it is much beyond that. Let's discuss these three factors and what they translate into if we go one level deeper. First one is monetary aspect. It simply means a simple return, which is in dollar terms, a more quantifiable return expected from your cloud investments. Second one is innovation, meaning how quickly are you able to capture growth through continuous improvement and bringing in innovation in your businesses. Third is compliance. It takes into account enterprise ability to effectively manage the regulatory compliance, which are again specific to their industries or their geographies. Next is resiliency. It means that how resilient is enterprises technology infrastructure in terms of how quickly you can overcome technology disruptions that occur in your organization. Last one is agility. That considers, considers both, again, business and operational agility aspect, which is required to rapidly evolve or rapidly achieve business outcomes. So according to a recent average group survey, we found out that a staggering 67% of enterprises believe that they are not able to realize the expected level of value from cloud. So uh, quoting a conversation here, we recently spoke with the CTO of a manufacturing firm who mentioned that they have failed in their cloud initiative and they were also stormed with unexpected cloud costs because the organization just wanted to move to cloud and they did not put much thought into what it meant for their businesses. So the point I want to highlight here, the struggle is real and we are hearing a lot about this a lot more now more than ever. Now, moving back to the cloud for value discussion we are having, let's talk about the approach that can be enabled for enterprises and also service providers play a role over here. In this slide, we discuss about what are key value generation levers which can help enterprises meet evolved aspirations. So we have come up with four levers. First one is industry contextualization of cloud, which translates into enterprises meeting business specific requirements either through adopting industry-specific cloud solutions or going for an end-to-end -end industry cloud stack instead of going for a general purpose cloud. And then how do they enable value from their cloud investments through this lever? So we are seeing a huge momentum that is driven by enterprise interest and also led by hyperscalers in this space. Next one is cloud economics. This focuses on driving value from cloud and it extends much beyond cost. So this not only includes reducing the total cost of ownership for enterprises, but also includes generating value through transparency, uh, architecture optimization, process optimization, and even through resource utilization. Third one is cloud sovereignty. So this specifically is becoming a key demand driver for European enterprises, and it is evolving into an important RFP ask. This basically means how are you able to provide a sovereign cloud infrastructure, which is compliant with data residency requirements of the organization, data governance requirements, technology ownership, and security requirements. Last is cloud sustainability, which essentially covers sustainability in cloud, off cloud, and through cloud. So we are increasingly seeing that enterprises are not just articulating sustainability as an area of focus in market communications, but they are also wanting to take concrete steps to realize these sustainability linked value from cloud. So we are seeing interest in themes such as sustainability optimized architecture, going for sustainable technology sourcing, carbon footprint management, 
vertical themes in BFS such as sustainable lending, green financing, etc. So now all these levers in one form or the other cater to different aspects of cloud for value that we were discussing previously. However, this in practicality, implementing these levers come with a lot of challenges. For example, for industry specific cloud adoption, there are a lot of solutions in the market from tech vendors and enterprises are clueless what, is, what it means for their businesses and what is right fit for them. Similarly, for other themes, uh, for example, sust uh, sustainability and sovereignty, there are vague, the definition of uh, sustainability and sovereignty is vaguely defined. The requirements are not clear, standards are not set in place, and it becomes very subjective for enterprises in terms of what they want to achieve. So what becomes important for service providers is how you define all these themes for enterprises and their industry in particular and put all this in perspective. Now, all these levers demand a differentiated service provider strategy. So we believe that there is a need for service providers to recalibrate market messaging and also take a value-driven approach across the cloud lifecycle. So in terms of value proposition and market messaging, service providers should become a thought leader in this space by actively leading uh, conversations with value enabled and business enablement focused market articulation. And also these themes, since they are partner ecosystem driven, really require service providers to take that responsibility of being ecosystem enablers as well as orchestrators by bringing the entire ecosystem together and enabling enterprise specific customization or contextualization when it comes to implementation. And similarly, so de developing domain specific talent expertise, investing in acquiring and developing cross-skilling talent, investing in strengthening the partner ecosystem, uh, co-innovation and joint GTM initiatives really become important over here. So the over overarching point I want to highlight here is that with multiple partner dependent offering and these themes garnering a lot of interest, there is a wide space for SIs to occupy. And the success lies in how do service providers capitalize on the momentum that has been created by partners, fill in the gaps in hyperscaler or technology vendor offering, create differentiation in this space, and then finally decode value for enterprises. Uh, so this concludes our first theme. Uh, with this, I would like to hand it over to Vishal, who will cover exciting stuff we are seeing in AI. Over to you, Vishal. Thank you so much, Deepthi. And uh, I'm going to be covering my favorite topic of artificial intelligence and data. And let me start off with saying that in a lot of ways, you know, we have come a long way. You know, the world has come a long way in its understanding and adoption of uh, AI. In fact, uh, contrary to popular belief, AI is not a new technology or a paradigm. You know, the the term itself was coined somewhere in 1950s, and the whole space has, you know, in the last seven decades, has seen its, uh, you know, fair share of uh, ups and downs. However, in the post-pandemic, you know, digital reality, you know, if cloud is the foundation uh, for the digital playbook for enterprises, I strongly believe that AI and data is at the center, at the heart of it where a lot of initiatives, a lot of the investment is getting pumped into it. And this can be easily seen in terms of, you know, the investments made by enterprises, you know, in terms of, you know, building their own capabilities, in terms of investments made by the investor community in, in, uh, in a newer startups, in, in, in a way, innovative, uh, you know, tools and technologies around AI, as well as, you know, uh, the, the investments by the supply side community. In fact, you know, in, in one of our surveys, we, we do this every year, it's an annual survey that we do in the state of AI adoption. If you compare, you know, 2019 and 2022 and the state of adoption, we look at in, you know, enterprise adoption through five different lenses as to whether they are planning to adopt, if they have done some kind of a pilot, if they have implemented in parts of the organization, there's a clear uptick in terms of, you know, the number of enterprises who are either piloting or, you know, have implemented AI in parts of the organization. This further gives us confidence and conviction that, you know, notwithstanding the last seven decades of history that AI has, given the current scenario, given the digital reality we are living in, and given the investments made by, you know, the entire ecosystem of enterprises, investors, and service providers, we are entering the golden age of artificial intelligence where everything, you know, will become smarter and intelligent. And we're already seeing that in our daily lives as well. The big question that we're trying to answer here is, you know, 
how far will we go and how faster we will go? And that's where the question mark for 2025 is. We still believe that a lot of organizations will get into you know, scaling AI, but in, 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 in our opinion and through our conversations, we believe that there are four key pillars that will define whether a particular organization will be able to scale AI across their organization. And those four pillars are, you know, data engineering, data is at the heart of AI, uh, you know, any AI initiative, uh, you know, any AI technology data is at the core. So data engineering is going to be very important. Cloud will provide the required scalability and compute power. ML ops is important to, to, to kind of finally, a lot of initiatives fail, uh, uh, you know, AI ML initiatives fail because, you know, the right kind of deployment doesn't happen. That's where ML ops comes into the picture and AI explainability, ethics and trust are gaining importance. I'm going to be talking about it in the next slide as well. So if you move to the next slide, see all of this, you know, paints a rosy picture that yes, AI is becoming real, but at the same time, we need to look at the challenges that a lot of enterprises face. Uh, you know, when they when they kind of start scaling AI. And while there are a number of things that have popped up in our survey and in our conversations, you know, related to insufficient budget, scarcity of relevant data, lack of business case, the top three, uh, you know, reasons or challenges that we've heard is one is talent. I think I don't need to speak about talent. Everyone understands it. Uh, you know, 2021, we saw massive talent shortages, especially for digital skills. The situation is becoming slightly better, but we still believe that the digital skills and especially skills around AI or data science that will continue to face heat in terms of talent. Responsible AI, we define responsible AI as explainable, ethical, and secure. It's, it's, it's going to be important when you try to look at you know, scaling AI. I can give you an interesting example. Uh, in 20, 2011, you know, uh, a set of bloggers and researchers, they found an interesting observation. They found that Berkshire Hathaway's chalk went up Every time there was a movie release, uh, you know, starring Anne Hathaway. Now, you know, never conclusively proved, but, you know, the seeming correlation, the seeming reality, uh, 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 similarity in the names, uh, you know, raised plausible speculation uh, that some of the trading algorithms were misrepresenting, you know, social media chatter, uh, you know, for positive stock sentiment. So think of it, you know, if you have to scale something like this across your organization, and if AI can do something like this, you will always be worried. So responsible AI will become extremely important as you look to scale AI across your organization, and especially in, in the face of, you know, stringent data laws and regulations, you know, across different geographies and countries. And lastly, change management is the biggest issue. You know, it can be seen through two lenses. One, how many people, uh, employees understand AI, which is the AI literacy part. And second is how do you really start, you know, deploying AI, which is, you know, the technology part and which is where some of the ML ops things comes into the picture. So what we're saying is these challenges, you know, needs to be, you know, specifically taken care of. However, if you move to the next slide, net net, see, with all of this, enterprises do believe, despite all the challenges and confusion, AI is seen as a transformative technology paradigm, whatever you want to call it. Enterprises do believe that AI has significant, uh, significant potential to enhance customer experience, significant potential to drive business growth, either in terms of new product development or in terms of you know, understanding your customers better and improve employee productivity through service op uh, operations optimization through intelligent automation. So there is strong belief that AI is transformative. So from our standpoint, you know, if you go to the last slide, next slide, you know, our advice to the to the enterprise community is that, you know, look at it from, you know, to realize the maximum value for from your AI investments, look at it through four lenses and focus on four things. Vision and scope, set the right short term and long term, long term objectives for AI. It's not one and done. It's a journey that one needs to take. And hence, having the right short and long term strategy, you know, will will lead to desired results. The, 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 uh, the, some of the change management and other things flows from the top. So culture and leadership become extremely important. Technology and talent, uh, needless to say, uh, building the right technology strategies, the right tools, as well as having the right talent. It, it can't be something which can be completely uh, uh, led by a particular set of teams within IT or technology. You know, there has to be meaningful collaboration between technology and business to drive AI initiatives. So build, so, so invest in having the right kind of data architectures, right kind of talent uh, teams for, for, for scaling AI. And lastly, governance and ethics, as I said, you know, responsible AI is important. Uh, the not only responsible development, but responsible use of AI is also important. So have the right governance mechanism in frame to ensure that you know the AI development, innovation, usage happening within your organization is happening in the right fashion. So, so this is what we have from an AI and data standpoint. Uh, 
we'll move on to the next theme, interesting theme on platforms. And let me invite my colleague, uh, Sangamesh, for it. Thanks, Vishal. Uh, talking about services demand from platforms such as SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, ServiceNow, Workday, it continues to be resilient. One key driver that stands out across all the platforms is industry-specific modernization. So let's dive deep and understand how are enterprise expectations evolving around platform adoption and how can service provider increase their wallet share? Yeah, so here, all right. Here we see five priority areas that we have picked from our enterprise conversations. So this is in uh, this ranking is in terms of year-on-year -year enterprise perspectives and uh, services opportunities. Let me start with uh, cloud migration. Majority of the platform-specific investments are driven by the need to shift from legacy to cloud, and with the increase in the maturity of cloud solutions, cloud platforms, cloud applications. So this transition has accelerated over the last two years. When these enterprises are thinking about cloud transition and adopting cloud applications, they are looking to applications that are more contextualized to their industries. Uh, we see a shift towards adopting applications more out of the box. They need applications which are already contextualized to their industries so that they can minimize customization. So that's why uh, we see industry application adoption is on the rise. And now about workflow modernization, uh, most of these initiatives around industry applications and cloud migrations, those enterprises who do not have the investments required to do that big bank transformation and wherein these transitions are fairly difficult because of the kind of customization that they have invested into over the years, so this is bridged by some of the workflow modernization tools, such as ServiceNow and Pega. So wherein they are creating new workflows on top of existing legacy applications. And the last two are more related and are emerging as key themes because enterprises have a lot of point solutions from different vendors. Speaking about integration, it continues to be a, a pain point for enterprises, especially with the adoption of most of the best in breed approach and multiple point based solutions that have been adopted by different uh, business units. And integration related challenges have been prioritized over the last couple of years. Enterprises are now looking for unified view across the organization. So they are taking a platform based approach to solve this integration challenge rather than very customized type of approach adoption of the likes of AmuleSoft or Dell Boomi is increasing. And the last one, this is more to do with some of the enterprises with uh, mid and last segment, wherein uh, there are multiple applications in their environment and they're adopting measures uh, to optimize their cloud or license spend on uh, some of these tools. Having said that, uh, in this next slide, let's see how is the enterprise satisfaction uh, uh, towards service partner. So, yeah, right. So here we see there are a few pressing challenges in the service partner ecosystem. Uh, the, uh, the satisfaction that scores that uh, you see here are compared between 2022 and 2021. Talent as an area has been a challenge for the entire IT services landscape. Uh, but if we look at specifically into enterprise platform specific talent, consulting and domain expertise have emerged as key challenge areas from services standpoint. This is more to do with enterprise expectations or a need for industry specific applications and process knowledge. Enterprises are looking for people who have that expertise. Uh, and this is also where there's a strong demand supply gap. On consulting services, enterprises are still turning to technology vendors in multiple cases to understand uh, the product roadmap and to understand industry examples. And with respect to expectations around domain know-how or uh, process knowledge, enterprises expect service partners to uh, provide industry specific industry practitioners who have uh, that in-depth knowledge in, in those particular micro industries. So whatever uh, we have discussed till now is fine. But let's uh, see in the next slide, what should service providers do? First thing, 
based on our analysis of uh, all the upcoming renewal opportunities in the platform services space, there are multiple large renewal opportunities um, in large technology platforms such as SAP, Oracle, Microsoft. Here, service providers need to build a more targeted strategy. If they are looking for growth, uh, they need to identify key accounts, the kind of opportunities and challenges uh, each account presents and build a more targeted strategy for these accounts. Second, uh, as we discussed, consulting is an important area, but we see white spaces in the market uh, when it comes to having the right industry consultants, uh, change management kind of guidance. So those are still missing. Uh, so service providers need to invest in those areas. Uh, third is, uh, while a lot of service providers recognize that industry expertise is needed and there are uh, new platform opportunities within industries, I think those who are doing better are targeting industries at a more granular level. Thinking about micro industries and prioritizing one over the other by going deep into a few of the promising opportunities, opportunity areas in identified micro industries. And fourth and fifth are again related to building those IP accelerators, having those functional and industry specific accelerators, uh, which could come handy and also building that industry specific talent. So that's, that's about uh, uh, from the platforms a theme. So uh, now I will hand it over to Nisha to take us through the exciting stuff around experience. Sure, thank you Sangamesh. Um, so as we speak about experience, uh, one of the themes that we really want to focus on is the fact that it's not just customer experience, but overall stakeholder experience will continue to form the centerpiece of enterprise investments in 2023 and going forward. Now, before we uh, unpack what stakeholder experience really means, let's take a step back and understand how this entire ecosystem of experience design and experience services is witnessing a change. Um, a lot of this change is driven by the fact that stakeholder expectations are continuing to rise as digital becomes uh, more important. And on top of that, the rapid technology advancements is also fueling stakeholder sentiments and expectations to expect more and more from the brand that they're associated with. So some of the trends that you see over here, for example, there is an increased focus on not just personalization, but real-time personalization and that too at scale. And when I say real-time personalization at scale, it's essentially a function of stakeholders expecting brands to send across personalized real-time communications and experiences across different channels, whether online or offline that they interact with. It is not just the focus on personalization, but there is an increased focus on privacy first experiences. Now, of course, we all know how the conversations around data have continued to pick up pace. Uh, conversations around data privacy specifically uh, became very important when GDPR became legally enforceable in June 2018. But what is really interesting about today is that it is not just government which is participating in ensuring that customer data is protected and hence first party uh, privacy first experiences are becoming important, but even some of the technology vendors like Google for that matter are retiring for third party cookies. And as a result of that, enterprises are increasingly finding themselves in a space where uh, they are still trying to provide personalization and that too at scale, but just with less data at hand and less access to uh, the information and third-party data that they have traditionally dependent on. On top of that, uh, enterprises are very much focused on providing sustainable and responsible experiences, which essentially translates into incorporating principles of sustainability when it comes to experience design and not just building the next addictive experience that customers continue to spend maximum time on. Um, moreover, the stakeholder journeys are becoming more and more complex with proliferation of channels, with proliferation of digitals. And of course, now conversations on metaverse picking up a lot of pace. Uh, enterprises are focusing on how to really understand and map stakeholder journeys and what are the moments that really matter and how to really enhance that stakeholder journey both across online and offline channels. 
um, omni-channel experience is becoming increasingly important because the complexity involved in proliferation of channels also lends itself to the conversation around providing seamless experiences across uh, these multiple channels. And as we speak, uh, the conversations around immersive experiences, uh, though initially it was important from the perspective of augmented reality and virtual reality, but with metaverse uh, gaining a lot of traction, especially when it comes to some of the use cases in experience design like digital commerce, or for that matter, uh, use cases in employee experience, such as employee onboarding and employee learning and development. All of this is leading to the next evolution in experience design where proliferation of channels, uh, increased focus on uh, privacy first experiences is making enterprises spend more and more on experience design. Um, now, if we move to the next slide, what this slide is essentially trying to say is that as this entire experience ecosystem is evolving and witnessing change, the enterprise spend towards interactive experience services continues to grow and it is expected to grow at a rate of 40 to 17% in the next three to four years. And as you unpack this spend, what really becomes important uh, as a service provider organization is to see that enterprises are not just focused on customer experience, which has historically been very important, but the pandemic really um, made sure that a lot of enterprises had started to focus on employee experience as well. Moreover, partner experience and society experience from the perspective of what impact a brand has on overall society and brand perception is also an area that is gaining increased traction. And if you were to unpack this spent not just across different stakeholder personas, which, which are becoming important, but also from the perspective of technology investments, what becomes really interesting is that a large percentage of spend is going towards technology services. Now, whether that's an outcome of platformization of experience or whether that's an outcome of investments in some of the new age technologies like artificial intelligence and uh, metaverse that we just spoke about, that is an area that's becoming important and service providers are focused on this entire construct of industrialization of experience as well. Um, and it's not just technology services, but creative and content from the perspective of uh, offering services, which traditionally design agencies have offered. A lot of IT service provider organizations are getting into that aspect of the ecosystem as well through acquisitions of design agencies and essentially being able to provide and become a single partner for end-to-end -end experience design. There is a lot of spend which is going towards creative and content. And the last part of the equation from the perspective of strategy is also an interesting area which is continuing to gain traction. And that's largely an outcome of the fact that as experience ecosystem is evolving and changing, enterprises are looking to partner with service providers which can guide their entire uh, journey from the perspective of what is the overall experience that they need to offer to the different stakeholders and what kind of investments from a technology perspective or creative and content perspective that they need to make in order to make this a reality. So what I'll do now, I'll quickly hand over uh, it to my colleague Abhishek who will talk about cybersecurity as the next theme. Thank you, Nisha. And thank you folks for covering all the topics because as you list out your own set of priorities, there is a term that you use, which is last but not the least. And security is that kind of a topic which is often comes last in the list of topics that uh, enterprise audiences engage in, but it's definitely not the least of those. And over the years, we have seen a lot of lip service being paid to security as an important technology priority. But what we can, can you stay on the last slide, please? Yeah, security as, as a top priority. But what we have started witnessing is that because of the need for perimeter protection and the financial implications of things such as ransomware and cyber attacks. And due to the proliferation of different kinds of technologies that we were discussing, whether it's cloud, uh, moving applications or workloads to cloud, whether we are talking about experience aspects, which leads to creation of many more interfaces than organizations that can't even imagine how to manage and looking at different aspects of data, platforms, all the topics that we discussed, all of them have vulnerability points attached to those. 
And each of these vulnerability, vulnerability points have a financial implication if you're not securing your perimeter. And that is what is leading to what we like to call the rise of zero. If we could move to the next slide, which is based around the concept of, hey, the enterprise security philosophy is going to be primarily based on not having trust in any sort of a arrangement that they make or any contract that they have either with the employees, different kind of stakeholders, so on and so forth, which basically means from a conceptual level that as organizations look at their security philosophy, there is going to be one continuous trust evalu evaluation for all kinds of resources, starting from executives down to uh, contracted staff. Assuming that there is going to be a breach, it's not a reactive way, but organizations have to assume that, hey, as we think of zero trust, we have to assume that there is going to be a breach so that there is a contingency plan for it. There, is, there are ways in which the organization is investing to circumvent those. And that's why, which will lead to granting the least amount of privilege that they would want to attach to any individual or persona or a group of stakeholders. So whether these are aspects or subjects such as devices, applications, users, and who are accessing resources such as workloads, applications, and database, using these tenets, those accesses will be provided or revoked on the basis of what is really needed. So that's entirely the concept. But if you look at, move to the next slide, where this tenet of zero trust is actually playing out, all industries. It is important for all industries to be looking at this as an important philosophy of implementing their security mandate and not just do lip service to it. But even in this group, there are first among equals, as we see in most technology tenets. So banking, financial services, tech, sector, electronics, and public sector happen to be the sectors which are driving a bulk of hot process around actually implementing zero trust. Moving to the next slide, I'm pretty sure you have this question around how zero trust trust is going to get implemented within the enterprise environments. It is still going to be heavily, as you can see on this chart, identity-based. Now, there are ways in which Organizations have started to think about micro segmentation, persona base, and all of those concepts. But given the level of granularity that is required to maintain all tenets of zero trust, identity based approach is con will continue to be the philosophy with which most organizations will implement it. So the question for you is as a service provider, as you are taking any of the concepts, whether it's cloud, whether it's platform, experience, how do you bring in the tenet of security as part of it? Or even if you are taking security as a standalone offering, the key themes to align with are going to be the four that are listed on the right-hand side of this chart, which is to ensure that you have a manageable approach to it. You, are, you can ensure scalability as organizations themselves are moving into new businesses, adopting new technology, same time, you have to be cost effective and have the ability to provide those granular controls that organizations really want to deliver on. So while this might seem like an abstract concept, but the way we are seeing it implemented from an identity perspective makes us believe that this is going to be one of the most important topics of enterprise spend cutting across technologies as we see them. So that was our kind of uh, overarching view on the major themes that are likely to play out. Now, having heard that, and I started off the discussion by asking you this question that out of the five themes that I am laying out in front of you, which are the ones on which you would like to have a conversation with us? Now, having heard us, I'm going to ask you another question, which is around having seen the opportunities that we have laid out, and if you had to rank them from the highest to the lowest in terms of what you are seeing in your conversations. And in case your opinion has changed by way of what you've heard from us, what would, what would it be like? So feel free to offer your opinion around which are the ones which you see as the highest impact ones versus comparatively lower in a rank order perspective so that uh, we can get a good sense of where this, how this plays out. It's interesting how the, okay, quite interesting. 
So as I'm seeing it, cloud in many ways uh, appears to be the one getting the highest impact scores amongst others, uh, followed by data and AI and platforms. Not surprised by it. Uh, absolutely. Great. So there is a very good distribution as I'm seeing as the poll results are playing out. Um, once we close the polls, I'll be, be able to offer more commentary on it. All right, I think we can now close the poll. All right, so as you see in this picture, now it's kind of a very nice uh, spectrum of colors that you're seeing in front of you. But if you compare it with the legend below, as I'm seeing it, most, most folks ended up mentioning cloud as well, the highest impact amongst the group that they are looking at. Uh, definitely so. Uh, data and AI and uh, platforms, difficult to choose between the two in terms of obviously the high, uh, highest impact scores, I think data and AI has got more than platforms. But interestingly, in terms of one and two, I think that total score of that, I would put data and AI, in fact, much higher than even cloud. That's that's very interesting. Not, I mean, I'm not surprised by it, given that even within cloud, we are seeing one of the major tenets of where organizations have started to focus on and their, as their next journey happens to be around taking now their data workloads onto cloud. So in many ways, apart from security, data happens to be that common denominator themes that cuts across maybe all of the themes that we are seeing. So it's very interesting. Great. So on that note, we will now be moving on to Q&A to see what some of the questions here are. One of the questions that initially that I had seen when Vishal, you were going through your section was the question around what does uh, change management and responsible AI mean? I know these some of these terms get thrown out by a, a lot of experts in the industry, but Somebody has asked this question around, how do we really define that? Are there some examples or tenets which would help them understand much better? Yeah, so I can I can chip in. So to responsible AI, uh, the while there are multiple things, we, we believe there are three core tenets to responsible AI, explainable, ethical, and secure. So think of it this way. See, in a lot of ways, you know, the innovation and the development of AI machine learning happens through the data being fed to the models, right? And, you know, we as human beings, you know, yes, uh, you know, we also have certain cognitive biases. And that biases, you know, comes out in our behaviors and invariably in the data that is out there. Now, when that data gets fed into the machine learning model, the model itself can also be biased, right? Based on, you know, the creed, color, religion, geography, you know, wherever you are. So what we're trying to say is, you know, the, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning models that you're using, they should be, you know, devoid of any bias. They should be ethical. And, you know, specific care needs to be taken in terms of what data they are being trained on and, and how they are developed. So that's the ethical part. The explainable part I talked about the Hathway effect, right? It's, it's came to be known as the Hathway effect in the industry uh, that you should be able to, you know, uh, one should be able to kind of explain how the AI model is coming to a certain conclusion. It shouldn't be a black box. And in a lot of ways, you know, the many of the models in the industry today, they are black box. You know, nobody really knows how they function and, and how they come to a certain conclusion. So we need to turn this black box to a glass box approach where everyone can see, you know, how the model is working, which imbibes more confidence in the enterprise stakeholders uh, as to, you know, what exactly are they deploying in the organization. And the third part, third tenant of responsible AI is security or, uh, or secure. And by that we mean is, as Nisha already spoke about, you know, data regulations are becoming extremely stringent, you know, year on year with the onset of GDPR in 2018 and then the California Act and other acts. And, and we, are, we, we already know that we are in conversations, you know, we already know that many other countries are already in, in, in the process of creating their own data regulations. With such a tight scrutiny over data and because data is so core and central to building AI and machine learning models, one has to keep the security aspect. Are you accessing the right data? What data are you using you know, to train your models? 
So that becomes again an important integral part of how you are building your you know, uh, AI models and machine learning models. So based on this explainability, ethicality and security is what we are defining as a responsible AI model. And what we are saying is, look, you, know, you can create you know, one or two models here and there, you can deploy in certain areas within your organization, which is fine. But if you have to scale AI across your organization, across all different functions and business units, that's where responsible AI will become extremely important. Otherwise, you will have nightmares to think about, okay, whether this model is working fine, whether this, whether do I even know what this model does? So that's what we're trying to say through responsible AI. I think the other part was change management. I don't want to hog the light. I know there are other questions. Change management quickly, you know, through two lenses. One, uh, you know, having, you know, your employees understand, you know, what we are trying to do, which is where the AI literacy part comes into the picture. AI should be everybody's business, not just you know the IT teams or the senior management business. So AI literacy, which means uh, uh, helping your employees understand and learn more about you know the impact that AI can have and how to use it. And number two is in terms of how you are really developing and deploying machine learning models in your organization, which is where there are certain different techniques and technologies that have already come into the picture. We talk about ML ops which helps in kind of, you know, segregating development and deployment because a lot of the issues comes there. So change management is really about, you know, helping your people understand uh, the benefits and how it is being done. And the other part is the technology part, deployment part. That's how we're defining the change management. Absolutely. In fact, that creates a nice segue into some of the common I was running through the questions and trying to identify if I could address two or three questions together given the common denominator aspects of those. One of the common aspects I'm seeing here is the question around one, change management is definitely there. Another one is related to cloud value realization. And I'd love to borrow from what you were saying, Vishal. In many ways, a lot of these technologies that are available within the organization for different kinds of stakeholders there, whether these are application owners, business owners, CIOs and CFOs themselves, uh, there are a lot many new shiny to toys out there. The question of scalability and how it links to their own performance or result indicators becomes an important aspect of how they will go about doing it. And that's where the question of change management comes in because at a, as, a, as an enterprise, as a CIO, as a chief technology officer, you might take the visionary approach of adopting certain tenets and technologies. But how do you really convince your wider swath of organization, different stakeholders, personas, even customers to engage with it? And all of these personas have their own individual challenges in terms of how they perceive technology. Some of it might appear as, hey, they touch it with a barge pole because it may not be well tested enough. It's a new concept, something, pick, something like metaverse versus something like ERP, et cetera, which is very well tested, has existed, but has become clunky. So organization and stakeholders specifically are asking the question, hey, should we really scale on this platform or should we be asking the question around re-architecting and changing? So that becomes all of these aspects in combination of personas, their individual needs and objectives, and how technology itself is mature enough to be scalable in their scenario are aspects that you should be considering as regards how you take the change management approach within organizations. And I tell you this for a fact, most of the conversations we have with CIOs is around, hey, building a business case for scaling technology internally, and you can help a lot by doing that. I'm just noticing that we are at the top of the hour, so I wouldn't be able to take any more questions. We'll be responding to those offline, but hopefully you have our access details, some of the blogs that we have written, some of the reports on this topic, which will allow you access to uh, these topics in greater detail. And we anyway have your inputs as regard the CTAs that you want to engage us on. Hopefully, we'll be speaking on those topics very soon. So thank you for your time.